What's up, guys? It is Rick with Flip with Rick. It is Friday, five o'clock, and it is that time. So, this is actually a really cool um, live we're going to do. We're just basically talking about my secrets to wholesaling success over the last two decades. So, those of you that don't know me, you probably know Zach. Zach is my son, um, and he's been doing this four years, and I got. He jumped in the business, got started. He actually did it on his own and I gave him guidance and I've been doing this 19 years. So we have just under 25 years experience with us both together. So uh, we run a entire family team. So it's me, my son <clears throat> and my wife, and we have several other employees and that's what makes up our company. And so what I want to do in this video is we're going to do a large Q and A and I'm just going to run you through the tips and tricks I've used. And they're going to be somewhat general, but they are absolutely imperative to the success I've had. So as people are piling on here, think of your questions. If you have a question, <clears throat> write it down and give me about 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to go through it. And now I didn't go through the exact order of my traits to being successful, but let's just go ahead and we'll kind of run it off. And these things are through 19 years of experience. So I think some of them are going to shock you a little bit. So, um, yes, I am going to be doing a Q and a at the end. So, um, do me a favor. All right. I see you guys putting in there. Awesome. Well, let's get it here. So number one, hard work beats talent. <clears throat> I've seen, I tell you doing this almost 20 years, the people that will commit and actually do what they say they're going to do and can actually apply a plan that are significantly less talented, but they work so much harder, they hands down crush the most talented, gifted salesperson I've ever met. So what does that mean? If you have a kick butt salesperson and if they have a poor attitude about what they're doing, the inevitable is going to happen. Their, their ego is going to take over. They're not going to be able to get it done. As opposed to if you go out and find that gal or girl who just wants to get a wholesale deal, will do anything, actually very nervous and stumbles over their voice, but they have indicated they will do absolutely anything. That person, hands down, will crush the person with talent each and every time. Guys, <clears throat> we all get the exact same amount of time on earth. Some of us have some God-given skills, but for the most part, when it comes to real estate, specifically wholesaling, is you actually have to put the work in. You got to put the attitude in. And if you think you can get by doing this business three and four hours for the rest of your life, it's probably not going to work out. Or you think you're so talented, you can do that. I'm telling you, you're going to be out hustled every time. So number one, hard work beats talent every time. Anybody tells you different, it, it's it's just BS. So here's my next favorite line. Great marketing, average acquisitions beats average marketing and great acquisitions. So what does that mean? Is you really have to be an expert in marketing. And marketing is what got me excited in doing wholesaling. Actually, I knew very little other than what they taught me in college. And none of that really applied to anything we did in wholesaling. So if you have a great marketing mind and just an average acquisitions mind, you, you'll do just fine. If you do it the other way around, it's not going to work. So the marketing is what's going to lead you to your incredible acquisitions and you can't without it. I've tried it, guys, I'm telling you right now, if you want to skip the marketing part for wholesaling, you're not going to make it in this business. So do whatever you have to do to become a great marketer the acquisition stuff you can actually pick up as you go because we're just trying to locate motivated sellers. We're not trying to buy every house. We're not realtors looking to list every house. And once you understand that great marketing is the secret sauce, great marketing is why I easily buy the cheapest properties in my entire town. It's I, Everyone's like, I don't understand how you do it, Rick. I know exactly how I do it. I, I show you right here on this channel. So it's no big secret. Don't let anybody try to fool you and go, he's got this secret, uh, this, this secret technique he does in acquisitions. No, guys, I tell you right now, it is complete 
high focus, high energy on marketing. And then I try to match that same energy with my acquisitions people. Some do, um, some don't. I know I do. I know Zach's done it when we did it. And that's what gives us our magical success. So moving on to the next one, talking about marketing. This is one of my favorite ones. Your business will die without marketing. If there is no wholesaling is without marketing, nobody knows what you do. And it's no different in this business. You you have to constantly be marketing. Everything I do in all, all my businesses in regards to real estate always lives and breathes around marketing. So <clears throat> without marketing, you won't have the leads. Uh, you won't be able to talk to sellers. You won't be able to do your your uh, your maximal allowable offer. You can't write offers. Um, you can't get funding. I, I mean, you can, but there's nothing you can do with it. Guys, without marketing, the thing is dead. So, okay, if you can take one lesson and walk away with it, now you've understood the marketing part. This one's huge. Consistent flow of deals. This is probably the number one thing you're dealing with that's problematic in your company right now because <clears throat> I'm always dealing with it. So 19 years, I'm always dealing with flow. I sometimes actually have times where we have too much flow. You're like, Rick, that's, that's crazy. Yes. If you don't figure out how to consistently market and go to your niche that what you do, you can actually outspend yourself. There's been many months where I've spent more money marketing. We had too many leads come in the staff couldn't get them to them fast enough and we lost deals because we marketed too fast. Now, completely my fault because I didn't set up the win and set up the staff to be able to convert those leads and you live and you learn. So the one thing that will reign true in this entire business is the word consistency, no matter what you do it. If you're marketing, you gotta be consistent. When you're writing offers, even if they're not to the finish line, write that offer so they have something in their hands. When you're following up with, with, with cash buyers, you have to send those emails. You, you have to make those phone calls. You have to consistently go through and do it. Cause if you don't, when you have a deal, you want to have a buyer, you have to be consistent. And you know how I feel about marketing. You put consistency in marketing. It will fix probably 90% of your problems. So in the beginning I used to do a ton of marketing. Then I go out and do a bunch of sales and acquisitions. I'd do all the appointments. I'd write a, uh, I'd write a bunch of contracts. I would get them out there. I'd follow up like crazy and I would get four or five, six contracts. And then I went through this perpetual loop. Well, guess what I stopped doing in the beginning, especially the first seven years, I stopped marketing. I stopped looking for cash buyers. I stopped a lot of things what I did. And what happened is I would have these massive three month pay gaps. If you guys will learn consistency, especially in marketing, you can easily, easily um, fix that issue. Probably one of my biggest mistakes um, early on, which leads me to our sellers. <clears throat> Guys, you have to put your sellers first. You have to think like a seller. You have to care for the seller just like it's your own mother. If you take that initiative to do it, you're never looking to rip off people. You're looking to create win-win situations. And you never have to look over your shoulder. So I have lots of local grocery stores in my town and doing this 19 years, I can't tell you how many times I run across somebody and I get the tap on the shoulder, Mr. Rick, Mr. Rick. And I turn around. Now, these are the days when I actually bought the houses myself. I didn't have a sales staff and I say, Hey, listen, uh, it's John. You bought my mom's house on fifth street and I would actually get a little bit tense when I do it. My wife's like, are we going to have a problem? I'm like, I don't think so. I go, I, I treat all the sellers like first class. I treat them like they're my mother. And the whole family comes up and gives me a big hug. I said, awesome. Like we still get to drive by mom's house and we get to see it. Um, you gave my parents the ability to move out over a couple months and everybody in the neighborhood seems to love you. Now I wound up actually keeping that house for a rental. But what I'm telling you is, I don't want to look over my shoulder when I go into the mall, into especially the grocery store and have someone go, I can't believe you ripped me off on that house. So if you always treat the seller for a win-win situation, they're the absolute best. You, you just treat them like family. There's no other word. You never have to worry about life. You never have to worry about 
an investigator looking over your shoulder, the state looking over, the federal government looking over. You don't have to worry about family members coming out, guys. Just treat your sellers just like their family. Just solve their problem and it'll work. If you're in this business for just for greed, you're going to get killed. So help somebody out, make some money, and then go out, help out like a thousand more people. That's the best way to do it. So, all right. Um, so set the stage. So I'm not a thespian actor by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Setting the stage took me seven, eight years plus. And this is talking strictly on the acquisition part. And if you guys haven't gone through like any of the trainings I do, I basically tell you to set the stage. So what you're going to do is set an outline of what your meeting with the seller is going to entail. This serves a couple of purposes. Number one, it puts them at ease. They know what you're going to like, how long it's going to take, what you're going to be doing. And number two, you set an expectation level. You're looking to help them solve a problem, no matter which way it goes. And you want an answer at the end of the conversation. The biggest struggle you have with most sellers, particularly motivated sellers, is, is getting to the final decision. And there's nothing worse when you spend 30, 40 minutes, an hour with someone and they go, I, I really don't know, Rick, I got to think about it. And that you can't, they can't put their finger on what they're doing. Setting up the stage gives them the expectation to give you feedback, to help them guide their information on their answer. Now, does everybody walk away with an answer for me? Absolutely not. But for the most part, I get a lot more truth. I get a lot more transparency if I set the stage. If you guys don't know how to set the stage, go back and look through uh, the Wholesaling for Real channel. And uh, if not, I will do a separate video on it. And all you are, just so you know, is you're setting an expectation when you meet with them before you like get into the, you know, the like the full on negotiation and everything. And it said, listen, by the end of this conversation, either you're going to love me to death and you'll decide to move forward and sell my house or you'll tell me, no, it's just not a good fit. Either way, we need to make a decision. Do you agree? And they usually agree. Once you have them agree to setting the stage, you can actually coax them in giving them an answer or why they're not giving you the answer. And uh, once we did this, it was a tremendous, a tremendous difference on it. So here's one of my next favorites, guys. Vet your cash buyers. Guys, this is the, when you have cash buyers, you don't have time to hear all their drama filled, how much money they have. It's just simple. Your first two or three questions should be vetting. Um, I just need a proof of funds. If they try to BS you on the, the proof of funds, um, they're most likely they're going to be another wholesaler or they're just messing with you and take it. If you don't know that person and they're already telling you a lie in the first 30 seconds you meet them, you can expect the rest of all your transactions to go that way with that person. So once we decided to vet our cash buyers, we just, we eliminated all the drama. I used to have two salespeople, their job was to go and sort through cash buyers. Now we just have one automated system and we don't let anybody get through. So if you don't want to show me a proof of funds, you obviously don't want to buy a house too bad for me. And I just end the conversation. So if you do this little skill, by the way, 75 to 80% of all buyers are going to lie to you. End of story. I don't have the money. I got to do this. And by the way, guys, hard money is not cash. I don't care what anybody tells you. Hard money is a loan. They have to get permission from someone to do it. Oh boy. I got a lot of them here. I keep forgetting it. Okay. You guys have heard me talked about scaling. So I run my operations with a team of four. I've run it as little as one. I've ran it as many as 15. I can tell you this. <clears throat> scaling isn't sexy and it's not as always as profitable as you think it is. Now, in some instances, it does work. Being in wholesaling for 19 plus years, I can tell you how many times I've watched people turn in these big uh, operations and 98% the exact same thing happens every time. The business runs out of cash. They're not honest with the partners. They start laying off employees. The partners start doing more and more work and the business unwinds. And one day the, the doors are just closed and people are saying, how the hell did that happen? People are out of jobs. People are hurt. 
And the bottom line is the partners weren't making enough money or they were losing money. So at the end of the day, if you bring on a partner and you want to like scale a business, you're going to have to at least double, if not triple or quadruple the business. And then once you start getting overhead and the staff and everything, like how much do you really want to work? Like, I don't want to work 60 hours a week to go make an average six figure paycheck. That's guys, you can get that in corporate America. You don't have to worry about that. So, um, I've scaled twice and I've done exactly what all the other people have done, particularly in South Florida and, uh, scaling. If scaling was so simple, our company, uh, our industry would be covered with multi-billion dollar, um, corporations running us. And guess what? They're not. They've uh, so many have tried it and there's just a level where you can't scale it and make your money back. So uh, marketing is usually the most expensive aspect when you scale this part of the business. And so you have to compete with someone like me who spends all my money on marketing, have the best acquisition system set up. I have no overhead. Um, I have no office and I can connect with any seller or buyer virtually. Good luck uh, trying to measure up with that. And my speed will kill you nine times out of 10. So, which leads me to my next one. I don't care what you guys say. Offices are not cool for wholesaling. They just aren't. They, your sellers don't give a crap if you have an office or not. Um, they're okay with a sexy website. They're okay with like sexy mailers. They're okay with uh, really cool cars if you want to pull up and meet people. But very rarely is a seller ever going to come to your office. So, by the way, I've had probably nine or 10 offices in my 19 years career. And it took me a long time to understand. I'd rather you take that two to four grand you spend on an office per month and spend it on marketing. Once you understand that marketing is the key to the success, you will never ever look at having an office the same. And the way our economy is, it's much, much easier to work virtually and you'll actually attract much higher quality um, employees. So Okay, guys, I'm getting to the end. I promise this. Um, this one's a huge one. I want to spend a little time going on over this. <clears throat> Don't worry, guys. I'm getting to a live Q&A here uh, shortly, I promise. Is stop getting advice from unqualified people. I got to tell you, this is probably one of your, your biggest killers, especially in real estate. So everyone's got a real estate story. Everyone will tell you about like some money they made or, hey, Listen, when you hear the words I hear or they say, I want you to immediately disqualify. It doesn't work. So gossip will not get you anywhere. Any type of social media forums or anything like that. When you guys go on forums and, and you go, oh, I heard direct mail is dead. My, I, I hear my buddy did a, a mailing and it, uh, he didn't make any money. Well, that's one person. I have no idea what his lists are, what his budget are, or how consistent they are. It doesn't matter. But so many of you guys take that and you, you, you treat it like the Bible and then you make decisions on your business. It's the worst thing you can do. So before you take advice from anybody, especially family, and the truth of it is if you don't want to walk, if you don't want to be in their shoes, do not take their advice. End of story. So if an investor is giving you advice, go, Hey, listen, show me your business. Show me like the last HUD you did. Show me how it went down and show me how it works. <clears throat> and if you like what you're hearing, then you know, maybe that's someone you work with or whatever, just even work for free to learn the ropes, whatever you need to do, like an internship. But so many of you guys are taking advice from people that have never made it. Like it would be the equivalent of me taking advice to get in physical shape from a person who's not physically fit. Why would I ever do it? Why would I take financial advice from someone that doesn't have a huge portfolio? Like if you can't do it for yourself, how are you going to teach me how to do it? And worst of all, guys, I'm going to tell you, hopefully my family's not watching, but outside uh, my son and my wife, I don't take advice from my family on business. You just, they, they love you to death and they're speaking to try to protect you. And they're actually doing you a disservice by doing that. So um, I was told, oh my God, I could tell you how many times I had a safe corporate job and they're like, don't do it. You're going to get killed. It's very risky. And now so glad I didn't follow that advice. So 
It doesn't mean be rude to family member. Just say, listen, I appreciate your advice, but I'm kind of just going to go my own way or don't even comment it and move on. Because if they own one little house and they're trying to tell you how to build a real estate empire, you don't want to be in their shoes the long term for that real estate position. It doesn't mean you don't love them. I'm just telling you. Taking advice from loved ones, um, they're doing it to try to pray protect you and it's biological and it's not going to help you out. I'm just, so just stop worrying about what others think about you all the time. Cause what you're going to do and what I do, we're completely off the grid. Like meaning we go against the norm. We do what uncomfortable, we do those uncomfortable things that nobody else wants to do. That's why it's so cool. And that's why I'm able to do whatever I want when I want. And I can spend as much time with my family as possible. So it's one of the reasons why you have Zach in front of you is because I did not take that advice. So whenever you take advice from anyone, especially in the real estate field, guys, and, and my advice is always to get someone that is doing it every day. And to me, some of the worst advices you get is from people that got out of the business. You got to wonder if the business led them to such great success and they're making hordes of money. Why would you leave real estate to go do coaching or something like that? Because you could probably make more money coaching and you're really not that good at real estate and it's just much easier to do it away. That's just my opinion, but I'll kind of, um, I will leave it there. Let's see. What else did I have? I'm almost done. Okay. I got a couple I didn't put on here on purpose. Let me see how much time I got five minutes and then we're going to go here. So, um, I also put on here is in wholesaling, you have to learn to assess and manage your risk. So everything we do is going to have risk, but here's my theory. And listen to me, if you're just starting out brand new, if you're working on a deal right now and it's only going to make you 1500 or a thousand dollars and you're assigning it and you know of no other way to fix this deal, like you can't get a reduction in price, you can't get a buyer to pay more and you're just assigning it, what do you think I'm going to recommend for you to do? I'm going to tell you to close a deal and take the money and learn from it because $1,500 and really no skin in the game other than the time and sweat equity you put into it, you've managed your risk very well. And that's what wholesaling is all about. If you can manage your risk and make a bunch of money, it's great. Now, as you move forward in the game, I want you to up your numbers. I mean, there's no reason you can't make at least 10 grand a deal minimum because I was doing that from the start. My average deal is pretty much 50, 60 K now minimum. And I'm talking about assignments even is if you don't have to close on the property, fund it and do everything, you have minimized your risk, but I don't want you to make a thousand, 3000 every town. Some point you have to start pushing the 10, 15 grand. You just need to find a new set of buyers work on your acquisition squil skills and the whole thing will come together. So once you have your risk managed and you're not taking a lot, take those little bit of hits, build it up and go, wow, don't ever switch to where I'm going to be all risk. And that like, I'm not going to calculate anything else. That's called speculation. That's where I'm not going to get the old cryptocurrency, but when somebody buys uh, like a pre-construction price house, and then when it's done in nine months, I hope the market's better, if not worse, you are doing nothing but gambling at that point. You That is not investing. It's definitely not wholesaling. And so you need to understand um, what your risk is. That's 100% risk. Wholesaling is almost zero risk if you do it correctly. So start out that way, work the numbers up, and then you can balance the two up. Sometimes you can leave like deposits or you got to get loans and you assess what your risk is. So Okay, here comes the last one. <laughs> Actually, the last two. Um, guys, lose your ego. Like, just get rid of it. So our ego is very self-serving, and it's always to look to make you right. <clears throat> and it will make you feel good in the short term, but I'm telling you, there's so many things where you have to bury your ego. Ego is probably the biggest thing I see getting in the way of deals. So from buyers, sellers, acquisitions, people, even owners is they can't let their ego down. And your ego is your ability to always want to be right at any cost. And we can all sit back and take a seat and learn from people. So I would tell you this, killing your ego is, it's actually shocking because you don't even realize you have an ego until someone points it out to you. And then 
once you realize like, okay, I'm not going to go there. So I always want to win the war. I never, ever, I could care less if I win the battle and all your ego wants to do is win every battle. So just kind of keep that in mind when you do it. <clears throat> and this all wraps around one thing, guys, when you become better at marketing, you come better at acquisitions you lose your ego, you become massively consistent. You understand you don't need an office to run this business. You understand you're going to set the stage and set sellers first. It's going to do the number one thing for you. It's going to build your confidence. That's it. The name of the game at the end of the day, the reason you guys are talking, listening to me is I know how to confidently to deliver you information. And that's why I do it with sellers. That's why I connect with people. My confidence is constantly fed by doing deals and understanding it and making money in the business and helping other people out. Zach, Zach was the same way. I'm going to tell you the first time he did a deal, I didn't think he was going to get the words out of his mouth. And now you guys, you, you've met Zach now. He's got a ton of confidence and confidence is a skill set that is learned through repetition. End of story. If you do it consistently, all these skill sets to become a successful wholesaler will coincide to give you the maximum amount of confidence. By the way, confidence doesn't mean you don't know how to admit when you're wrong or anything like that. It just means like, listen, I am well prepared to talk to you and I understand this game better than anyone. And I want to help you out, Mr. Seller. How can we put a win-win deal together? And that's how I talk to every seller. Everyone thinks I have like this super slick presentation. I don't. So I'm true to myself. The more I'm true to myself, the higher my confidence goes, my family sees it, my son sees it, and this is what I teach to everybody who I work with. So guys, let's get into the Q&A. Um, let me bounce over here. I see, oh, okay, we're gonna take them all in order. And, oh, wait a minute. Let's get up here. Um, Okay, so go ahead and start popping in the questions. I will answer them. Um, and what I'll try not to do is repeat too many of the questions. And do me a favor, once you put your comment in there. Hit the subscribe button. So um, people always ask, hey, Rick, Zach, how can we help you out? The more you can share, <clears throat> share our lives and understand, let people know we're not gurus. We're, we, I've been in this business 19 years, Zach's been at four years. And our, our entire goal is to teach you how to wholesale for free without all this convoluted, you got to pay me 10 grand to figure it out. It, guys, it's like learning your ABCs. And in return, if you'll subscribe, share our videos, likes, comment, help us blow up on the internet is we can build the biggest, baddest community out here. And we can do some really amazing things. So people are just in shock. By the way, we don't run any type of advertising. Everything we do is organic and everything is natural. So the more we can like, share, subscribe, I really, really, really appreciate it. So let's jump into the questions and you guys can feel free. We're talking about what makes a successful wholesaler. Um, I actually have a note on here. Um, I actually, I'm gonna wait till somebody brings it up and then I'll, I'll put it on there. So I left one out on purpose. So let's see here, Rachel, my son and I have started this together. He's 17. Uh-oh, I got competition. We'll branch out next month when he turns 18. He has already began cold calling and has been fat, fantastic at the ABC. So awesome. So you're probably talking about wholesaling. Rachel, that's great. Just understanding um, he's young and let him guide. And um, people ask me, you know, how did you catch lightning in a bottle with Zach? To be honest with you, um, he worked at a, like a, <laughs> a local grocery store and just decided, you know, how can I do like what you do? And, um, so a simple suggestion, um, if you guys are even talking about a younger family member, it doesn't even have to be a young family member, just get them some real estate books to read, um, real simple books. Um, the simpler, the better, um, rich dad, poor dad, if they're young, kind of understand the relationship with money. Um, any of the creative financing books, if you guys have a question, I'd be happy to post them up there. So that's awesome. Kevin asks, will you, uh, will you do foreclosure list from Zillow and Redfin? I don't work them from theirs. Um, I do them. Uh, I do everything from uh, listrei.com. 
Uh, Zillow and Redfin's a little bit more for um, the FISBO type. But if you have more information, you can please share it with us. Okay, here's a good one. Bonds asks, how do you, how do you automate the verification process for your cash buyers list? So in today's age, it's never been simpler than uh, the easier than now. So <clears throat> you can simply set up a, a one page um, lead sheet and any of your, uh, your lead providers, um, there's, uh, what is it? There's so many right now. Um, there's lead pages, there's carrot click funnels. All those are paid services. They run like 60, 70 bucks a month. I would tell you the easiest thing to do <laughs> is just go to, um, what's the one we like to use? Uh, Zapier has a function that you can build one in there. And I think you get one free application or you can go to Google forms and you can create a sheet right there and you get a link for it <clears throat> and you can put that in your ad. And it's just a simple question. And the key to the question is make sure you prioritize your questions. Proof of funds has to be like question number one or two. If they can't provide your proof of funds, do not waste your time because they're going to talk to you for 20 minutes and tell you how they're going to get money from this property or that property. You don't care. You just need the one buyer for that property. So um, a simple lead page, I wouldn't pay for it. You can use a lot of free services. Um, Google Forms does a great job with it. If you guys use Podio, you can actually use a form in Podio and customize it. Don't ask me how to do it. <clears throat> um, but a lot of that stuff will get rid of the tire kickers right away. Or sometimes, even if you go old school and leave a voicemail and say, listen, do me a favor, um, leave your name, um, number, and tell me what bank you're at and what your available cash balance level is. Just see if they even answer the questions. The problem is if you sit there and ask all these questions, if I ask 10 people the question, I know eight out of the 10 are going to lie to me. And that's where I just get really, really annoyed. So any type of automation to get through that initial like BS factor will help you out a lot. So good question. Okay, guys. Any questions? Actually, oh, Roy Price. So <laughs> if you guys heard me before, <clears throat> speed does kill. So speed is everything in wholesaling. I, I missed this, so I'm giving you props to it. What do I mean by speed? It doesn't mean about like rush through it. But like once you have the skill set on how to talk to people, how you're going to fund a deal, even being via assignment, or you're going to partner up or, or do a wholesale, once you know what you're going to do with it, you have to move with methodical speed or you will get beaten out. You know why? Because I've been beaten out so many times. I've constantly preached to my staff, speed kills. So this is one of the things I had in probate. So I taught a probate court out, out there. I probate course, and my number one saying is speed kills. It means if you move with consistent, massive action, you will probably get the best deal. If you drag your feet, try to solve every problem and try like to give them more information, somebody else will beat you to the punch every time. So that's a good one on speed. Speed does kill. You have to move forward. You can't wait. And in the beginning, most people hesitate, they act slow, and someone like me comes along. It's just how the business works. So if you guys are working with a motivated seller right now, keep moving along because they're not going to wait for you, especially in a market like we have today. So awesome. Brandon says he can't hear. Hopefully, I let me know if you can hear now. Okay. Justin says audio is good. Okay. Natalie asks, do you offer tenant buyers rent credits with lease options? So I will tell you this, it depends on what state you're in and states are really starting to crack down on this. So I will tell you this, if you're going to do some sort of lease option, make sure you have two separate agreements, a bona fide rental agreement with a standing deposit on its own, and then an option agreement. <clears throat> and neither one of those contracts can refer to each other. Otherwise, you can be breaking laws in your state. So I'm not an attorney, so I'm more comfortable if you answer it um, with a local real estate attorney in there because I don't want anybody to get in trouble and doing it. It's a great idea in theory, but a rental contract has to stand on its own and an option contract has to stand on its own. So you have to be careful how you put the uh, terminology in there. So I, I love creative deals. 
Cynthia says, love this tip. Awesome. Okay. Pop off. Do you think cold calling Philo, uh, Zillow Fisbos is a good idea or is there a better way to cold call? So just for the record, there's, the worst type of cold calling you do is when you don't do it at all. So if you're okay with that and it works for you, then knock yourself out of the park. That was actually one of the predominant ways people got a lot of their leads. Why? A, they were free. Well, you got to skip trace them. <clears throat> um, but a lot of people didn't do that initially with Zillow because realtors were using it so heavily. So I would give it a shot. I, I would track your data. So after you make 1,000 calls, 2,000 calls, 5,000 calls, look at your data because the last thing I want you to do is beat your head against that computer and not get any results. So I don't know if it's the best information. I've heard people having phenomenal results and some people not having any results. A big part of it is your confidence level and like how you want to attack it. Do I think there's better lists out there? Yeah, I like off-market lists, code violations, tax delinquencies, um, utility shutoffs, um, eviction lists, stuff like that. And here's the problem. Everyone's chasing lists. So whatever list you chase, just be different and stand out, especially on cold calling, understanding that first 20 seconds, you got to get through that call and you've got to change. You got to flip the script on them. <clears throat> so the biggest objection you get is like, uh, how'd you get my number? And you got to get past that like super quick. Hey, my, hey, my partner just handed me this list and he thought your house would be a good uh, house. We're looking to buy in the neighborhood. Is, is that house still available? And just get past the question and get open dialogue and then you'll get there. You guys on SMS, you need to get them on the phone. So pop off if it works for you, do it. I would do a little bit of testing on it and see what your comfort level is. A lot of times it depends on what market and what town you're in. Good question though. Okay, I'm taking all questions and orders, guys. So let's get them in. I'll stay on here as long as I have questions. Bern asks, I work from one to nine. Uh, the time before I work, I would recommend getting a list and cold call it or drive for dollars, cold call that list. Try to make the best of the time. Either one of them works, right? So like the, the, the worst time you cold call is when you don't do it. So people are like, oh, what's the best time? What's the, there is no perfect time. The perfect time is when you can do it. I would do a combination of the both. That way you have a consistent um, source of leads. You can get a lot of these li uh, lists very, very cost effective, especially with listrei.com because you get 10,000 leads a, a month with that are included within the price. So that's what I like to do because it's the best bang for dollars. And then if I run out, I can always add driving for dollars. But even if I don't use them all, I love driving for dollars because it's usually the fastest way to get to a deal because you're looking at houses that have issues. Houses that have issues have a story. When there's a story with a house, you have an opportunity to buy it on wholesale. End of story. So the faster you can get to that, the quicker you can do. The problem with cold calling, you got an idea that a house is a problem, but you don't see it versus driving for dollars. You definitely see a problem with the house. And you just got to connect with a person to get a good deal. So um, I do a combo of both. All right. <clears throat> Let's see here. Bible witness, if time permits, can you do a video specifically about setting the stage? Huge game changer and one about automatic team buyers list. So I'll make a note of it here and see if I haven't done it before. Guys, don't overcomplicate setting the stage. You go out tomorrow and set the stage. Setting the stage is just telling them, hey, this is what you can expect. This is what I'm going to do for you. And either way, I'm going to help you out at the end, even if I don't buy your house. But I got to get an answer from you. Either you love me to death, you want to move forward, or you don't like what I have to say, and you'll give me a hard no, and we'll part as friends. Uh, to be honest with you, that's my 10, 20 seconds uh pitch to setting the stage, but, um, I'll work on that one. It'll be a dedicated video without a Q and a, cause it's hard to do without the Q and a. So, um, maybe just like a role play. That would be a really good one. I'm telling you guys, setting the stage changes everything because, um, it's like, okay, well, I, I guess you can really like a little bit, like, it doesn't matter if you're a guy or girl, you ever wanted to date that person so bad. 
and you date them and you don't really know if you're on a date or they just like gave you a pity, like I'm going to take you out to dinner. Setting the stage defines this problem. Like, are we going on a date or are we just going as friends? And there's nothing worse investing all your time to find out they just want to be friends and you want to like something else. Wouldn't you rather know that up front? And that's all setting the stage does if that helps you guys. It doesn't tick anybody off, but like if they're not interested in you and they don't want to do it, why are you going to spend an hour with them? So um, I will definitely work on that. I got that on my notes here. Um, okay, now see, now we're getting good questions. They're all good questions, by the way. Toby says, what are your thoughts on paid masterminds to accelerate growth? <clears throat> I actually have no problem with it. So the problem is, is in truly defining what, hold on here. Sorry, a little business. Um, what is a mastermind? So masterminds now are the, the, the new boot camp. So when I was starting out in uh, 2003, boot camp was the word. You got to go to the boot camp. You got to go to real estate boot camp. So now we fast forward the masterminds. And by the way, I've been, I've been to way too many masterminds. Um, I've been to every one of them. The, the problem with masterminds now is there's no ex. All you hear about is the promises that are made the next level. You're going to meet people, but there's, I don't know, man. I, I think there's a huge connect on masterminds. I, I would know if you're going to do a mastermind, know who's going, who's running it. And I would find at least three to five referrals from people that have been there one year plus that keep going back and over and over and over again. So, um, a lot of people go to a mastermind and they just expect all their real estate, everything to be solved and handed to them. And I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of times I walk out of masterminds with more questions than answers. Does that make sense? It's like I ask a lot of hard questions and a lot of people don't like it because it, I, I don't fit the norm when I go to a mastermind. So when I go to a mastermind, I tell people, if I'm going to pay you the money, and I, by the way, I've paid as much as 30 grand for a mastermind is I'm going to ask hard questions. And if I think you're bullshitting me, I'm going to tell you right up front. And like more than half the time, I, I either get kicked out or I'm asked not to show up again. Because guys, at the end of the day, the, a mastermind is about you bring value, they bring value. Everyone brings something to the table and we all benefit. Fast forward to a mastermind today, it's a paid networking group. And the reality is most of them is you're paying... Um, how should I put this nicely? A professional network broker, you're going to pay them that fee so you can connect to their crowd. You guys, you can do it for free. How do you think Zach like knows everybody? He goes out and just connects with everybody. He's never gotten on a plane to do it. Um, he's never uh, secretly attended a re-event to try to gain like access. Just go out and talk to people. I can't tell you how many of you, and don't do this right now, okay, guys, because I don't get paid to do this. So I do this, uh, I swear to God, out of the love of my heart for uh, real estate is, I've had a lot of people just like call me up and go, hey, yeah. Uh. Now, some of you bullshit me, um, and when you bullshit me, I just hang up. But when you're brutally honest with me, I'm actually impressed. Somebody got through the other day. Um, I'm not even, even going to tell who it is, but um, they, they just, oh, I'm trying to get a hold of so-and-so. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. We went to school together. Yeah, what school did you go to? Couldn't answer what school they go to. So you're going to tell me to believe you went to school with one of my family members, but you don't know the name of the school. Guy finally broke down and like told me like who, how he's looking for it. Guys, stop lying to people and be honest with your people. So <clears throat> if you know of a mastermind of people that are bringing massive value and you're the dumbest guy in the room, and you're okay with the price, go for it. I'm going to tell you, I've been to so many of them that I just walk out and go, man, I don't know what I was thinking when I entered that one, or I didn't ask enough questions. So, um, so when you're talking to somebody mastermind, <clears throat> I did a video. What was it? Well, I posted a video. I don't know if I've released it yet, but I put the five questions you have to ask every mastermind group. <laughs> And if you can get past question number three, you're doing amazing. So, and guys, it's, uh, so 
Toby, just to give you some, like, if you like the crowd and you know they have a legitimate business and they're not in the coaching sector, do go for it. But why not find an organic mastermind first? So some of the best masterminds I have are people from all over the country. And about once a quarter, we get on the phone and we just, we take an hour and we just rocket fire, man. We, Hey, this is what I'm doing. And we all got each other's back and we don't share the information like crazily, like, um, because a lot of them are advanced strategies and it's organic. Everyone's there for the right reason. And if you show up to this event and you don't provide, you don't get to go on the next call. So everybody has to bring their best foot forward. So start with an organic mastermind or shoot, man, like build your own or just go out and invite somebody and interview them. Like, so if you, you know, let's take someone like Zach, just take an hour and interview them, like ask a lot of questions. And here's the key guys. If you ever interview someone, spend some time with them afterwards to really get to know them and their family. And it really sticks and resonates. So I, I like to exchange money to expedite my learning curve, but I will tell you there is a huge flood of gurus out there. And it's, to me, it's becoming really problematic. And so unless you've gone and visit the guy's business and you know what they're doing, they're doing deals and they got lots of references, then knock yourself out and just make sure it's going to be a positive experience for you. And by the way, if you're going to ride on a boat, um, they're going to take you on a plane ride or a fancy dinner. You're getting clues is they're going to waste time is listen, if I only had you for three days and I wanted you to teach me everything else. Do you think I want to spend half a day on a boat smoking a cigar and drinking with you? I don't. I can go do that on my own. Actually, I'm really good at that. So whenever you go to a mastermind, I rather spend, if it's two days, I want two days. If they're going to teach you yoga or meditation, I'm not, like, I do all that stuff. I just, I'm here for a real estate, like mastermind. That's what I want to do. So Toby, ask some hard questions on it and you'll quickly find out if it's right for you. So good question. Najir says, what is the key to buying deeper? <laughs> um, really just become really good at marketing and become a master at acquisitions, specifically negotiations. And when I talk about the setting the stage, if you're not setting the stage, I promise you, you're leaving 20% on the table every time. So once you get confident in talking to people, um, you can do the terminology, what I, I, what I should my extensive library here. I wish I could show you guys. I hid that book. Um, there's a book out there called go for no. It's about that thick, it's a tiny little book. A friend of mine introduced it to me and it just shows you how to push the boundaries on everybody you talk to and real estate. No exception. It's one of my favorite. If I don't get a no on my first offer on real estate and Zach will tell you this, I feel like I did a huge disservice and you're like, what? I, I want to get a yes right off the bat. So if I offer you a hundred grand for your house and you put your hand out and shake me and go, yes, I'll take it. I know right there. I just probably left 30 grand on the table and my heart sinks. I'll still move forward and do the deal. Like I'm a man of my word, but I'm just saying, as opposed to the guy goes, listen, I tell you what, I, I don't know. I, I might like, don't shoot the messenger. I, I might be able to do 50, but you probably won't work for a guy who goes, you know what? I might be able to do that. Can you, can you give me just a little bit more? I don't know, like 51 guy goes 52. You got a deal. And I'm not going to bend over and give the 52 because this is the art of negotiations and it's how it works. So in the old days, I would have reached out 80, 85, knowing I could sell it for a hundred. And now I've learned. So when he says, no, I just know that's, I can't pass that threshold, but now I kind of know where he's thinking and I love to do it. And Najir, take that skill set right there. Um, there's a book out there called Go For No. It'd take you probably 30 minutes to read it. Go read it and it'll change how um, you talk to people. It'll help you out a lot. Really, really simple read. Great for anybody who's starting out in sales as well too. It's not even real estate specific. That's the really cool part about it. Okay, Lula asks, uh, what marketing strategies would you recommend? So first of all, you, you have to do something. So there's so many ways to do marketing. So the first thing I'm going to do is you got to figure out what your budget is. If you don't have a lot of money, you're going to have to do a lot more sweat equity. Door knocking, driving for dollars, cold calling on your own, stuff like that. 
if you have some money, you can you you can outsource some of it through um, direct mail. I like SMS because uh, if you're a one person operation, you can do the whole thing and it is very scalable, but uh, it's getting more and more saturated and eventually it's going to be illegal. Um, cold calling. I only recommend do cold calling if you do it yourself and you like doing that stuff. I hate it. Um, Zach's really good at it. And then if you want to teach someone, then you can outsource them. But people who've never done cold calling and they go instantly to outsourcing it, they're usually the ones that get killed the worst because they don't understand how any of the KPI numbers, how much time and money it takes, the types of software, the type of solicitors, and they get killed on it. So I would find what resonates the most with you, Lulu. And if you hate cold calling, don't do it. Like that's my only thing. I've never done cold calling because I didn't, I, I would probably fail at it miserably. But that's why Zach's part of my company. He loves doing that part. He knows how to run the entire staff on it. I have no idea. I just give him the budget and we just kind of run with it. So you got to find something that resonates within you. Um, as I said, SMS is kind of an easy one, but you got to get them from the text over to the phone. Um, and then the other one is just good old referrals, like talking to them. My, my, by the way, my first deal came from a referral from a realtor. I went out and met with 200 realtors. I only got like, 10 that would meet with me and one of them gave me like a super hot smoking deal. So just to go to show you only cause I promised to give her the real estate commission after I bought it to resell it. So it was no big deal. Uh, Jonathan asks who signs first at the closing, the seller or the buyer. Technically it doesn't matter because it doesn't work till both sign. So, um, I usually like to sign last it's just cause I'm a wholesaler. It's what I do, but, um, it doesn't matter. They're usually going to sign on that same day and wh whichever, um, whichever works for you. So by the last, is there a way to get super fresh data on comps or is prop stream about the best around? I, I like prop stream. I, it just, it's reliable. Um, if you guys, um, you can get a trial membership at listrei.com. It works really well before. So if you ask me what I use for pop stream, um, there was multiple, there was multiple data services we use right now, but I got to be telling you between Zillow, Trulio, Redfin, realtor.com, prop stream. It's they're all getting it from the same place. So I wouldn't worry about it. Sometimes um, if you have access to MLS, you can get maybe a day or two quicker, but it's not really, really a requirement. So um, I wouldn't sweat that one. Okay. Hold on, guys. I'm trying to get caught up here. So here's an interesting one um, post on here. Since many wholesalers are rubbing their hands in anticipation of many foreclosures, what are your thoughts? So Mr. Facebook user, I've been rubbing my hands for a year and a half. There's nothing here. So I predicted wrong and I admit it. So uh, very rarely will you ever see uh, an investor. You'll never see a guru admit they're wrong. So, uh, I fully anticipate after COVID hit that we were just going to take a massive market dive. And as you guys know how the story played out, it's been the complete opposite. There's so many factors that go into it, but um, I got to be honest with you, if they foreclosed on all these properties, they would mostly be sucked up so fast by the de demand is at an all time high interest rates are at an all time low and inventory is at record low. So this is not Eventually it has to come down, but I'm just telling you, everything's pointing uh, at least for the rest of 2021 to stay status quo. And then even 2022, they're calling for like 5% plus appreciation, which kind of shocks me. But so guys, here's the key is we're doing wholesaling. Wholesaling, it doesn't matter if the market's going up or down. I want you to understand that you don't care. I just like it going one way or the other. It helps. It does because people make decisions. So values go up. I want to sell values go down. Oh, I need to get rid of this thing. So it doesn't matter where you are because you're wholesaling, you're mitigating your risk and you're getting rid of the property. So 
if you're banking on this wave of foreclosure, I gave up on that um, nine months ago. It just And remember, real estate doesn't happen like the stock market. It takes 12 to 18 months for data to wash through. And by the time someone starts a foreclosure, like in the state of Florida, it can take up to a year. So what you need to do is just work within real estate, how you're doing it now, and stop worrying about everything that's going to come down the road. The record low interest rates is really what's driving a screw into this. Plus inflation is driving up the cost of everything. So the cost of a new construction house is so high, it doesn't even make sense to buy one versus an existing price until the existing home prices exceed the cost of a new house. So, and you can see the builders have not really doubled down on production because they're all kind of hedging their bets because they don't even know how much it costs to build a house anymore. So I wouldn't even worry about it anymore. Stanley asked, how, how do you run your numbers to see how much the house is worth? This is how I do it. So uh, just use the uh, trial version of listrei.com and don't overthink it, guys, because I tell you, I've done it 100 ways. Nine times out of 10, it is spot on. So you make adjustments on your local market, and that will guide you the right way every time. So. Ah. Uh. Uh, player dropout. Can you tell Zach his wholesaling son? So what's up? Okay. I'll do that. What's up? I like that. It's a movie with that saying, and I forget what it was. And he says, a great answer. I'm glad I can help. Okay. We're kind of going lightning round here, guys. I I'll answer as many questions are on here. So I'll go lightning round. So start typing them in there. Thomas asks, do you double close your 50K deals or your sellers don't care on a, a case by case? It's really case by case. I, so I still do a lot of assignments because I, I don't like to waste money in the company and it's perfectly legal. So if you can do assignments in your state and it's illegal, and by the way, I only know of two states, it's completely illegal. It's not illegal. You just got to get a license for it. Then do what you can do. So what does he mean by this? Like some people get like all but hurt if you're making a profit on a deal. And I find out that only becomes a problem when you don't set the stage with people. So if you tell them I'm an investor and I'm here to make a profit and they say, what are you going to do with the house? Honestly, I don't know. It depends on how much I have to buy it for and how much I have to put in for it. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions about the house? And just by setting the stage right there, they understand I'm there for a purpose. I want to solve their problem, fund them, but I'm going to make some money doing this. So I've had a few people blow up on me um, and it's because I didn't set the stage correctly. Every now and then you get a very, very difficult buyer. And then I, I would just double close it anyways. But guys, you're not really hiding anything because it's going to pop up on the tax records anyway. So you're just, you're avoiding the inevitable phone call. So I just, as long as it doesn't kill the deal, I like to just kind of put it out there. But um, you got to understand if it's legal to assign in your state and your seller is okay with it, there's no limit for the amount. I've seen six figures on the assignments. It's not a big deal. It really isn't. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. Let me see. I got some of the same questions here. Jory asked, if you have no EMD to put down, what are other ways you can get an EMD? So EMD stands for earnest money deposit. Now, you got to understand, you're not even, you're technically not even required to put down an earnest money deposit unless your contract indicates it. So I can't tell you how many contracts I've done that, well, I was sloppy in my old days. I had a $500 deposit. I never left a dime. If your seller really wants to sell that property, and they trust you. And EMD is usually not going to get in the way unless they're being instructed by a realtor or a family member. So um, you can put down a simple, um, like on a lot of contracts in the beginning, I used to do a $10 earnest deposit and I would give them the cash. But I don't know, $10 is kind of light. 
Um, a lot of people have changed it to a hundred dollars, but, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not here to give you advice, but like you can enter into an agreement without a deposit. Just deposit is the norm. And that's what makes everybody feel so good. That's why you see it on every contract. And it's, it's supposed to be a sign of good faith, but you know, $10 or a hundred dollars, um, who cares? Like when they buy it. So if you, if you don't, here's my idea. If what you can do is you can get a thousand dollars from a friend or a family member and put that money in escrow where it's safe and then cut them in on the deal. And if you're doing an assignment, all you have to do is a thousand dollars and give them back 500 bucks when you assign it. Um, so they earned a 50% return with really no risk. That's how I would probably do it in the beginning. If not, you can write your contracts. You don't have to put an EMD. It can be zero. Um, but if your seller starts to bulk, it could be a problem. So you have to kind of manage your risk on that. So EMDs, it's not required. It's just recommended. That's it. Uh, Steve asks, you do a video on cleaning up your leads on your spreadsheet and organizing leads. I'm going to have somebody else do that video because I'm the worst at it. So I don't, I don't like doing that stuff. And um, I pay a VA and one of my acquisitions people to handle that. But I'll have to look and see the best way to do that. You don't want me doing it, buddy. Okay. Going through the list. Hey, Rick. Jill, I got a cash buyer's list from PropStream and Skip Traced. But so many numbers are wrong and don't exist or bad. Where can I get a cash buyer's list? So prop stream, you just got to look at your filters that you're getting them from. Um, make sure they're, they're in the areas you're looking to buy. Um, number two is you're going to actually work with realtors, believe it or not. Um, our realtors hold the key to a lot of my best cash buyers. Well, Rick, how do I get that? Well, if, if you have someone that has access to MLS, they can re uh, pull a report of um, cash buyer agents, especially people who have bought in the last six months to a year in a particular zip code, especially have bought multiple properties and just reach out to that agent and just pay them. Like they don't care. A lot of them will take a thousand, 2000 bucks for you to refer them a deal. And these people buy like super, super fast with prop stream. It just takes time and you got to clean your database. No numbers are like perfect and I get it, but the other way you could do it is just to advertise. So um, a, a simple way to do it is Facebook Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace. And a lot of these things are like free. Like it, it's really not that hard to find cash buyers right now. So I wouldn't like be killing yourself completely to do it. Um, you can also search. Um, emails are a predominant way to get it. But if you can get their direct cell number and then just get them on um, a text thread. And every time you have a property, send it out there. So just keep refining your approach. It's I got to be honest, you getting a cash buyer is kind of the easiest part of the business right now. So I wouldn't, if you're spending a lot of energy on it, especially money, you need to just modify how you do it. And don't forget about using the realtor option because it really, really does work. Actually, my last five deals have all been sold um, through realtors. Okay, let's see here. Jacob says, trying to fire... My nine to five ASAP by becoming an acquisition machine and JVing everything I get under contract. Is that what you would do to fire your nine to five? So um, I had a nine to five. I didn't do this. I didn't switch over to us 33 guys. So I had a nine to five because I had to take care of two small children. I had a mortgage and I had a wife. So I know you guys can all relate. Um, so what I did is I hated my job, even though I was making really good money is I found this thing called wholesaling, had no idea how to do it and uh, took a huge leap of faith. And um, I developed a six month strategy um, to get out. So you got 24 hours in a day. So nine to five, I know where you're going to be. And then I methodically took every hour after that. I typically take half a Sunday off just um, for family time. And I worked through it. And then I came up with a number that I, if I could come up with uh, one year of my salary through wholesaling, I would quit my job. And uh, I actually did it in about four months and I waited six months. Um, and I got to tell you, man, getting fired at work um, from a job you've been at like 12 plus years, that was a joy. Because 
I had I had to get fired to uh, get what I wanted. So um, I tried everything I could to get fired. I kept just get promoted, and I finally had to have a meeting with the boss. So Jacob, I I think you're on point with it. Um, you guys don't need to quit your jobs like overnight. You have obligations. If you have no obligation, you got money setting aside, go for it. Like knock yourself out. You will be a very happy person. But I'm just telling you, you will never trade dollars for time you get back in your life. You've got to switch that equation up. So um, I think you're on the right path. Just keep, you need to talk to the people that are most important in your life and make sure you're on the same page, especially if you have a spouse. Um or you're living with someone you care about, just don't do it blindly because they don't know what you're doing and you got to kind of bring them in on your decision process. Okay. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Was, uh, I just saw, let's see. Man, I lost. Okay, so here's one. Sebastian, what's up? On my way to appointment, seller once. I assume it's 80,000. I got poor eyes, guys, or 800,000. But I need it at 40,000. What's the best way to approach the seller with my offer? So, Sebastian, go out to the property, set up a stage before you meet with them. And so here's some, some really basic tips. You should have a good idea of what's going on with the house by now from your initial conversations with them on the phone. And then when you go out to the property and when you first pull in, I always go early, drive around the block, look around, and you can quickly see if it matches up. They say, is the grass up high? Is the house look like it need painted? Usually the inside is going to be indicative of the outside or vice versa. And if the house is really bad, I want to go in the house and I want to be, I want to be immersed in it, you know? Because I want them to understand the problems of the house. A lot of sellers don't even understand the problems of the house because they've been around it so long. If the house is really, really good and it's spot on with a white picket fence, I get out to the street and walk away from the house as fast as possible and try to see how I can I relate to the seller's problem. So remember, real estate, there's always two ways to get a great wholesale deal. One is the seller is motivated. Or number two, the house is motivated. The house being motivated, it just needs a lot of love and repairs no one's taken care of. When it's the seller, they need money. If you have a seller that's motivated and the house is motivated, it's usually a no-brainer deal. So use those tips and walk through. And a lot of the strategies, um, a good friend of mine taught me when they get so outrageous on their price. So they want 80, you want 40, I get it. So when they say 80,000, uh, you got one or two ways to answer it because it's so far fetched. I I'm, I don't know if I can chase somebody around for a fifty percent reduction. Is how did you come up with that price? And just shut your mouth and see what they say. Well, a realtor said this. They said that. Or go, Mister Seller. Here's what I can do: is let me see what the house can afford, and just shut your mouth. So so many times people go, well, I need a hundred thousand dollars to retire, or I need fifty thousand to get my son out of jail, or my sister needs twenty five thousand dollars to go to beauty college. Hey, I tell you what, let me see what the house can afford and see what we can do. And just start going into the numbers of the house. And it should have some issues if they're on the right list and you can kind of walk them through it. So it's guys, you just got to talk, keep talking to people. Okay, Jonathan. Jonathan's got two questions on here. Guys, I'm taking the last five questions here. We're done. I've done dozens of deals and paid for the gurus. You guys provide more practical info than all of them. It's true because I'm not a guru because I actually do this business. So a guru is simply someone who started out wholesaling. They got kind of good in it and they decided they could make more money flipping people than houses. And that's why you have this guru show going on. I'm not part of it, so I appreciate it. So let's get down to Jonathan's real question here. What's the process of hiring VAs to track KPIs? What KPIs do you track? Is there a video that you have about it? So I believe Zach made the video on the VA, but if not, I will look it up. Um, process of hiring a VA. The, the biggest challenge with a VA is VAs don't know what you want them to do. So you have to sit down. So last week we talked about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I was making a reference to if I want to teach someone how to make 
a sandwich, you got to like tell them how to get the bread out of the cupboard, what type of knife to get out, how to spread it. You have to do this all for VAs. And what will happen is when you do all this, it's painful. It's brutally painful. You're pulling this stuff out of your brain. And if you'll go through those process, which can take you weeks, if not months, you actually give your VA a shot. So your VA, we all think we know what's going on up in here. Your spouse doesn't know what's going on up here. Your kids don't know what's going on up in here. And I guarantee your VA doesn't. So don't even worry. So I would spell out what the top two or three tasks you want them to do and have them master those tasks. And I don't care if you got to write a 30 page like operating procedure, go ahead and write it and you'll do so much better with them. Guys, I've been guilty of firing VAs because I didn't train them right. And when I do it now, like I have one that just does skip tracing. It's their job. They have a manual for it. Um, we, we look at KPIs, how many they skip trace to their success levels and the ones we're connect, connect with the phone. And we just simplify the process. So I love VAs, but most of you guys are not fully prepared on how much it takes to prepare to train them. And that's the challenge. So, so I should appreciate it. So looking for my horse wholesale deal, not even if I get the experience of talking to that. Yeah. Talk to as many sellers as you can. You'd be surprised. They all have a price in their mind that they will let the house go. You just got to find it without ticking them off. So guys, um, that's about it. It's, uh, what have we been on this thing? Just over an hour, hour and 10 minutes. Um, I will take your suggestions for videos. Um, I like the idea about the set the stage one. So if you guys have any other comments, this is a great place to drop them in. I'm here every Friday night at 5 p.m. Eastern. This is equivalent to the best mastermind you're going to get for free. I didn't charge anybody a dime. Um, the beauty of working with me and Zach is we don't ever ask for your money. We don't ever run an advertisement. And we just want you guys to be successful wholesalers. So I've been doing this 19 years. You guys know Zach's story and we just like to have fun. I hope our enthusiasm comes through. Uh, we're a true family business that um, we like to have fun. We love to make money. We love to help people out. And guys, I'm not saying all gurus are bad out there. I just, the, the ones that go from, I'm going to be a wholesaler to like a full-time coach and then I'm going to give you a mastermind that you have to pay five to thirty thousand dollars for, and we're going to take you out on a boat, guys. You guys keep believing in this stuff that it's going to solve your. It's not. I'm just telling you. You need to work with people who actually do the business. I've been here 19 years. I've been through just about every type of market cycle. The stuff I taught you in the beginning. If you're just doing it now, tune in the first 20 minutes, and I give you the keys to success of a wholesaler of two decades spam and it doesn't change. And I will end you with this. I, I forgot to give the last key is it's relationships, guys. You got to go out and form relationships. So just like I'm establishing a relationship with you, I'm not violating it. I'm not going to hit you over the head with a product. I'm not going to give you some BS coaching course. I tell you, it's going to change your life. I'm telling you, if you just do what I do, you will get through it. I'm telling you it, it's that simple. So do me a favor, guys. Share this video with someone that you think might be struggling in wholesaling or just getting started and they want to have fun. They want to work with me and Zach. And we post, I believe we post every day. We are the fastest growing source on the internet for wholesaling now. And I ask you guys, just do me a favor, share this video with as many people that are like-minded, just like you and me. And let's get to the top together. I'm out to create as many $100,000 wholesalers for free as we can do within this community. Guys, jump on a board. We're having a lot of fun. You're getting a free mastermind here from somebody in the business 19 years. And the more success stories I can share with you guys helping flipping your deals, doing wholesaling, the more we can grow together and everybody wins. So I appreciate it, guys. I will see you next Friday, uh, 5 o'clock Eastern. And uh, you guys will see Zach shortly. I appreciate it, guys. Go out and have a stellar weekend. Go get some deals done. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.